Hi friends, this week we're talking about Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. And typically in churches and places of faith, it's a time of great celebration. And we have the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem and the waving of the palms and everyone's shouting Hosanna. It's like, yay! But what's going on in real time in first century Palestine is actually filled with conflicting emotions, incredible heartbreak and strain. And I want to talk and unpack a little bit about what's going on in that section. So in Mark 11, 1 through 11, Jesus gives instructions to two of his disciples to go ahead to this village and find a colt that is tied to a post and untie it and bring it back to him. And he says, if anyone asks what's going on, tell them the Lord needs it and I'll bring it back to you. So it's a very action hero kind of response, right? It's like a very John Wayne, James Bond kind of thing. Like, what are you doing with that? I'll bring it back. Thanks. And what's so interesting about this is that Jesus wants this donkey, this colt, to be brought to him, and he wants it to be unridden, untested, unblemished. This is a motif throughout Scripture that God is going to use something of high caliber that has not been tainted by the world to move in someone's life. The same idea applies to the Virgin Mary, that she, as the one who will conceive God, is in fact virginal, is not blemished by the world. Even the color white that we use in places of worship as symbolizing purity is that way because like in weddings and baptisms and Easter and Christmas, the color is white because it's meant to be pure and unblemished, untouched by the world. Because God in his infinite purity brings something that doesn't have any baggage to our lives. And we're not used to that. We are so used to interactions with people and things and institutions that have some kind of caveat, some kind of catch, some kind of baggage. We're always looking for the angle. We're always looking on how this is going to be with strings attached. And when God moves in your life, it's with no strings attached. Jesus says, go to this village, find this colt that has not been ridden and bring it to me. And he anticipates the human response. If somebody says to you, why are you doing it that way? Why are you taking that cult? Tell them the Lord needs it and I'll bring it back. Jesus rightly anticipates what all of us have done so many times. When God is about to move in our lives, when there's the potential for change in our lives, when Jesus is proverbially entering Jerusalem, our city, in a new way on the heels of Easter, this moment of resurrection and new life, when God is right about to do something in our lives, we are the ones who say, do we have to do it that way? Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to go to church to be a good Christian? Why do I have to say prayers every night if God knows my heart? If God is so infinitely wise, why do I have to talk to him at all? Why can't I just be spiritual in my own way? And we are great at rationalizing God out of the picture. And yet we expect time and again, at the drop of a hat, God March through my city. Bring about new change and new life. I'm ready to herald you and say, Hosanna. I'm ready for an Easter story in my life. But we sometimes, if not oftentimes, don't want to prepare. And instead, we have the question that stops it in its tracks. Why do we have to do it that way? Why do we have to do it? And the answer, I imagine, is that we don't. There aren't many have-tos when it comes to God. God's not sitting up there keeping track of how many times you pray or how much money you're giving away or how many times you hold the door for someone. It's an invitation. The relationship is an invitation that if you choose to, you get to welcome Jesus into your life. If you want to, you get to say, save me, Lord. Let me prepare my life better for you. Let me push aside some of the clutter that distracts me, that keeps me away from the things that are important. It's an invitation. We get so lost in the obligation of faith that we miss what's really happening. Jesus wants to ride into your life and do something new. He wants this donkey, this colt, to be unridden, unblemished, top tier, not touched by the world. 
In the Middle Ages, people in Europe would use this idea when they were building new cathedrals and churches. And if you look at pictures of have ever been over there, all these places are covered in gold and jewels and marble because they wanted to use the best for the Lord. It's the same reason on why most places say, go ahead and dress up when you go to church. Look your best, bring your best to God. The things that we have decided in this world are most valuable, like gold and jewels and looking nice. We want to bring our best before God. But that too is an invitation. If you want to bring your best before God, you can. Or if you feel like you have nothing left, if you feel like all you can bring is your bare boned raw self, then God accepts you just as much. You look at a story like Raiders of the Lost Ark, when they're looking at the Holy Grail and it has to make the choice of all these different goblets and chalices that are covered in gold and bejeweled. And instead it turns out to be this very plain carpenter's cup. We get to bring and prepare and welcome in any capacity before God. It's not about the words that we say in prayers. It's not about the frequency in which we attend church, but it's an invitation to say, if I want to make room for God to move in my life, there's probably something on my end that I can be doing. So the disciples bring back this colt. It says that they throw cloths over it and then Jesus gets on top like it's a saddle. That this will be the vehicle in which God moves to the lives of the people in Jerusalem and first century Palestine. And then the very next line in Mark 11 says that the people start to put out blankets on the ground. As if to say, God, when you move through our lives, I'm inviting you to come sit by me. God, as you're moving and doing something big, I, I want you to come and be with me. I want to be a part of that. I want to invite you into this space. Sometimes I think the most beautiful prayers that we can say are simply ones of invitation. God, I invite you into this moment. I don't know what that means. I don't know what I expect. I bring nothing except an invitation for you to be with me. The people in Jerusalem lay out their blankets to say, come and sit with me. Jesus riding on a donkey into Jerusalem is a fulfillment of scripture. Hundreds of years earlier, the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 9.9. You've heard of Brooklyn 9.9? This is Zechariah 9.9. And Zacatech prophesied that Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, will come riding on a humble donkey to the streets of Jerusalem. And so for Mark, the gospel writer, to note this is giving credence, giving street cred to Jesus, that the readers and listeners of the story would say, because this is the Messiah. This is someone that you need to take seriously. This is someone that if you choose to invite into your life, he has the backing, the willpower, the capacity to leave lasting change. We go through our lives with so many different influences, different relationships, different jobs, different realities. And so many of those things fall short and we're left wanting more or we're hurt or we're burned or we're disappointed or we mess up. There's one thing and one thing only that that doesn't apply to. And 2000 years ago, he rode on a humble donkey into the city of Jerusalem that would change everything. This event is a big deal. Before this, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Senes, the Romans, the religious leaders of the time, they were pretty much okay with Jesus doing his thing on the outskirts. In Capernaum and Galilee, okay, here's this miracle worker who's really charismatic. He's got these crowds of people that follow him and let him do his thing. It's fine. It's not a threat to us. But the insecurity sets in when he decides to come during the Passover seeming like a, like a direct challenge to their power. And this is what always happens when power is challenged. Insecurity and fear is met with force, hatred, derision, and violence. Palm Sunday, it's not just a celebration. It's a declaration that power has been misplaced. 
The power of God had been misplaced and replaced by the power of humanity. Jesus enters Jerusalem knowing where it will end on the cross. It's extremely hard for us to replace the things of power in our lives with the invitation of God. We have built up these idols, oftentimes just within ourselves, that we have the right answers, that we know better, that we trust these other voices, these other things, these other people, and they inevitably will falter at best or let us down at worst. Part of Palm Sunday is a challenge to us to look at the places of power that we have built inside of our minds and to say, will this really fulfill? Will this really sustain me? And if we say, I know it doesn't, to dig deep enough to say it, but I know that there is one, that there is a God who does not falter, who is steadfast in love, who can march into my life to create lasting change. The people put their blankets down on the road as Jesus comes into their life in a new and powerful way to upend the powers of the time. They have palms that they lay down as well and they shout out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. And when we talk about this in Sunday school and we talk about this in church, we think Hosanna is like huzzah. Huzzah, here he is, yay! Hosanna is a word that is filled with desperation. It is a welcoming to a new power that cries from the very soul of their being to say, save us. Save us, son of man. We are prisoners under a power that is not our own. Jerusalem is occupied by Rome. They're being forced to become like the Romans, to change their ways of life. They're in a constant battle with the religious leaders of the time who are saying, you're not being legalistic enough with the law. And if you fall short of the God that you claim to worship, you're condemned to a life of isolation, depravity, and torture. Conflicting religious views, different acculturations. The Babylonians, the Assyrians from before, and now the Romans are saying that your way of living is wrong. It's oppressive. They're under the heel. And as Jesus comes in finally to Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, as a fulfillment of scripture. They cry out and say, come sit with us. We invite you and save us. Would you save us, son of man? Because we have nowhere to go. Nowhere to turn to, no power that can change our lives except for you. Will you save us, Hosanna? As we seek to reach the end of a pandemic that has taken so many lives, that has divided us as people throughout the world, that has wreaked so much havoc, that we feel prisoner to, as we've wrestled through our political life in the past years, as we've sought to reconnect with neighbors and friends who now feel distant. Maybe you have felt the weight of being under a power that is not your own. And you cry out with the people of First Palestine, save us. Save me. Hosanna. It's a beautiful word. It's a declaration of power that I believe you, Jesus, have the power to create this change. But it's one of desperation. Friends, know that Easter is so much more than some day of the year. At the advent of Christ into your life is so much more than a parade. It's an invitation for you to replace the things that have held you captive, 
that have blinded you in denial, that have kept you at distance from a true and genuine relationship with a God who desperately loves you. It's a chance to welcome a new spirit of wholeness, a spirit of life, a life of release and joy. Peace and love, brothers and sisters.